All right. All right. Let me get the go ahead from Mamie. Are we are we good, Mamie? We're good. We're recording. All right. Good morning, everyone, and happy Juneteenth. My name is Jeff Sellers, and I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Tennessee State Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual program entitled Juneteenth Reflections, Museums and Cultural Competency. Thank you for joining us for this very important conversation as we commemorate Juneteenth. Uh, before we get started, let's go over some of those very, very important housekeeping tips for you. Uh, the first thing you should know is that we're using a platform called WebEx. It's a little bit different from Zoom, but uh, has some of the same features. Uh, first, let's take a look at that mute button. Everything should be muted, but just in case, let's check to see. It should be a little uh, microphone down at the bottom of your screen, and it should be red. So um, if it's red, that means you're muted, and uh, no one can hear uh, other than just the panelists. Uh, Secondly is the chat feature. We do want to have you uh, communicate with our panelists today and the best way to do that is to click on the little icon that looks like a text bubble. It's also down at the bottom of your um, screen and when you click on it, it'll open your chat box to the, uh, to the right of your screen. Simply click on um, all panelists in the drop down menu, type your questions and they'll be able to see your comment or your question. <coughs> If you have any troubleshooting issues, we have uh, our staff on the call, Rachel Helbring and Mamie Hassel. They're there to answer any uh, tech problems that you have. Uh, just uh, select their name and they can help you with, uh, with any issues you have. And that kind of takes care of our housekeeping tips. Uh, I'd, I'd like to now go ahead and get started and I'll introduce our moderator for today's conversation. It's our curator of social history, Ms. Bridget Jones. Many of you know her, her work and the great work that she has done in the community. Bridget works to preserve and interpret the vast social histories of the many diverse cultures that inhabit the state of Tennessee, including African-American history, Latino history, and Middle Eastern history. She is a Memphis native and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Tennessee State University in Nashville. In 2019, she gained certification through the National Association of Interpretation and the Smithsonian Institute of the National Museum of African American History and Culture to become an official interpreter of African American, the African American experience. Most recently, she served as Director of African American Studies for the Bellamy Plantation in Nashville. And we're so happy to have Bridget here with us today. Bridget, if you're ready, I'll let you take it away. All righty. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you all are able to join us today. Happy Juneteenth, first and foremost. Again, if you need anything to do to help commemorate this day, enfranchise Black business, shop Black today if you can. But I'm going to go ahead and begin introducing our panel. I'm going to also let them kind of introduce themselves. Um, so first up, we have my former professor, Dr. Lee Williams. So tell them a little bit about yourself, Dr. Williams. Um, Lee Williams Jr. That's important for my father. Okay. Um, I'm associate professor of African American and public history at Tennessee State University. And I'm the coordinator of the North Nashville Heritage Project. Um, from Tallahassee, Florida, and I've been at TSU for while. Well, it's going on ten years now. Um, honored and grateful to be on this panel. Um, thanks for inviting me, Bridget. Of course. Next up, we have someone that I have looked up to for quite a while. This is Dr. Noel Trent. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Bridget. I'm uh, Dr. Noel Trent. I am the Director of Interpretation, Collections, and Education at the National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis, Tennessee. I am a proud graduate of Howard University, and um, I am excited to be here. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least is my friend and mentor and whatever else I need her to be in the moment, Mrs. 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 <laughs> Ms. Tamar Smithers. Trying to throw that on you, girl. Ah, that's all right. Throw it on me. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you so much for having me, Bridget. I'm Tamar Smithers. I'm Director of Education and Public Programs for the National Museum of African American Music, set to open uh, September 2020 right here in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. Excited about that. Uh, originally from New York, I was Director of Education uh, for Community Folk Arts Center, which is a multidisciplinary art center through the African American Studies Department at Syracuse University. So loving the work that I do, loving the work that you're doing, um, and I'm so excited and honored to be on this panel. Thank y'all so much for being here. Well, we're going to jump right on into the meat of this discussion. Our, um, conversation centers around museums and cult uh, cultural competency. So our big topic is how can museums assist in the creation of a more culturally competent America? And so I'm just going to throw these questions out there and whoever feels like this speaks to them, feel free to kind of speak up and jump in. So our first question is that there is a big debate between older and younger museum practitioners. And this big debate surrounds the idea that museums may or may not be neutral spaces regarding the relationship between activism, the interpretation of history, and history's effect on current events. So with that said, in your opinion, are or should museums be neutral? Yeah, I'll jump in here. Let's be real. Museums were never neutral. Let's look at how these things were founded. If we are really clear, they countries went and pillaged and plundered other places, brought them back and displayed them as a sense of their colonial powers. The concept of a museum has never been a neutral space. And so to presume neutrality is to take yourself out of the fact that we have always operated as a political space in some sort of way, whether it's to the, affirm the identity of a country, to affirm our contributions in areas of science or technology, um, or how we see childhood, um, that's how we function, right? So if you take that off the table, then the question is, what is the positioning of your institution in a society like today? And I'll also add, you know, a lot of folks say, well, art museums are neutral. No, they're not, because they're putting forth standards of beauty and visualization, and you're privileging what, you, uh, what should be appropriate. So we are not a neutral space. We've never been a neutral space. Let's embrace that and then use that to figure out where we should go next. Absolutely. Anybody else want to jump in there? I agree with Dr. Trent, you know, no, we are not neutral spaces, um, but I do feel that we are a safe space where everyone feels that they can learn um, and get information on topics and subjects that they may not be privy to or didn't have knowledge of prior. Um, and it provides an opportunity for discussions um, mm -hmm. and collaboration. Um, and with all due respect to our ancestors and the trailblazers who paved the way for myself and my peers to work in this particular field and industry, now is the time, especially today, like there is no time, space, or energy for anyone to be teetering on the fence of whether they want to stand with a particular um decision or not like you have to take a stance and you have to be fully committed to that so i absolutely agree that museums are not neutral especially today i know that's right dr williams you bring a different perspective from the university standpoint i'm interested to hear how you feel about neutrality in museums is it a thing um they've never been neutral nothing about them has ever been neutral in my mind i I was sitting here th listening to the scholars before me, and it's like, wow, they have a pretty, they have laid out a pretty good case for me. Um, but they, for me, museums are inherently political spaces. We make decisions about what we are going to exhibit, um, who's going to be represented there, and and um, how much of the material is going to be represented there and what is going to be represented there. So this institution as it functions um, is political and it was created in the midst of politics. Um, the locations of the museums are political. Um, the, the, I, I think the artists that we celebrate those we ignore, those we marginalize, that's a political decision. 
Um, so there's nothing neutral, as the sisters have said before me, there's nothing, nothing neutral about museums. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, I think we said that and left it right there. You, you can't even really piggyback off of that no more. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on into our next question. So Ford Bell is the former president and CEO of the American Alliance of Museums. And he stated, and I quote, that people don't think about museums as being a critical piece in our educational infrastructure in this country. And I think that's absolutely true. People don't really consider museums a, a complete educational piece. Most people come for entertainment and to just get a little bit of knowledge. They're not coming to be actually in, ed educated. However, with the way that museums have historically and in many cases are currently interpreting Black history, what have we been unknowingly teaching the public about Black culture and Black people? I, um... I'll I'll start with this one. Hey, um, as I listened to your question, I tried to think about you know what exactly is culture. I remember being taught that culture was anything we do or create to invent at enhance our survival, enhance our well being. Um, in order for a museum to teach diverse cultures, they need to have some level of diversity there, not just on the, you know, with the uh, people that are making the exhibits, but in the administration. I, um, in the classroom, when I teach African American culture, I, I, I realize that, um, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I don't teach it the same way that I taught it when I first started doing it in 1999. And that's because we've learned more. There's been a lot of knowledge that has been produced since um, the, the moment when I sat in a grad school classroom to right now where I'm struggling with teaching it. Um, people are out there doing amazing work. So if you were to sit in my class now, you'd get a lot more information about black women not to suggest that I'm an expert on black women. I'm not suggesting that <laughs> at all. Um, but I, 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 I do my best to look at the institution now through marginalized views, views that have been marginalized in the past. So you get a lot of interpretation of the institution through black women. I try to look at children. I try to look at the least among those in society and see how they view um, view black history in general. So I'm not a museum person, but I would hope that um, that folks in museums are taking the same sort of viewpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. Your exhibits shouldn't look the same way that they looked 10 years ago. Um, how you view the civil rights movement or whatever topic you decide that you're going to engage, it shouldn't be you know, we have a few items or artifacts from 15, 20 some odd years ago. We're just going to roll with that again and put some new cards underneath <laughs> it. Um, no, because, we, because we've learned more. And as we learn more, our interpretation should become uh, more precise, more engaging. Absolutely. And, 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 um, and lastly, um, museums, I think, should teach us to ask better and more informed questions about the past. Right, right. Yeah. Now, I'm gonna make this question just a little bit more specific because when I talk about um, what have we been unknowingly teaching the public about black culture and black people, let's take, for example, the majority of, of, of white institutions, when you focus on black history, you typically get two types of history. You get the history of enslavement and you get the history of the civil rights movement. However, there's, it's almost like a, a hundred years in between slavery and civil rights. What is that absence of history in between slavery and civil rights? What does that say to the public? 
Well, here's what I would say in, in regarding to your first question. I find um, Fort Bell's quote interesting because AAM will also say on Museum Advocacy Day based on surveys and statistics that people do view museums as knowledge and authority spaces, which is very interesting in this time period that we are. So we hold a very unique power, but as part of the educational infrastructure and places you can go and learn, um, I, I have to agree that I don't think that that's how they're viewed, right? This is the extra thing. It's not a necessity in your life, in your quest for lifelong learning. And that's a shift that we mentally have to do. But I will say that when we look at how the stories are told, we have contrasting things that are happening. There's what you see at these predominantly white institutions that are doing larger surveys. And then you have to take a look at what African-American institutions have been doing from the founding of Hampton Institute's museum, now Hampton University's museum in 1868. Um, so at the same time that the Smithsonian and folks are collecting things from parts of Africa, they're actively collecting, but they're telling the story differently. You know, and it's only recently within what the last 20 or 30 years that we see a shift in how those stories are told. We're still dealing with the fact that there's an absence in a lot of institutions of capturing the academic conversations among noted black scholars and translating that into meaningful exhibitions that care that relay the complexity of black life in the United States in particular. Um, I think we have some great black curators there, but we also have some great black program officers. And too often what, ha what happens is that they are DEAI um, hires, and then they're, all of the responsibility of the institution's cultural sensitivity is placed on one individual. When the yeah. reality is, is that this is something that should be borne by the institution from the board through frontline staff. It shouldn't be put on one person. Absolutely. And two days before June 19th, you decide you want a program to reach the black community. That's not going to work. What it needs to be is a deliberate engagement of black scholars. There are a plethora of folks Heck, you can go to the American Intellectual Historical Society's webpage and find a plethora of Black scholars doing work on multiple facets of Black life in America. We've moved beyond someone like David, the late great David Driscoll having to do his 1976 Two Centuries of Black Art in America at LACMA because people didn't believe that there were Black artists in America for 200 years. We've moved beyond that point. Now you should be talking about the nuances and the discussions and disagreements among Black artists, right? That's right. where we have to move. And if your institution has not moved to a place of having anti-racism discussions and being open from top to bottom culturally, you're not going to hit that. And that's why, you know, you know, I appreciate the curators at these other institutions, the black curators and curators of colors who are pushing for these stories, but they are so overloaded and overwhelmed. And that burden should not just be borne by someone with black or brown skin. Whoo, child. That you just word. said it, left it there. Tamar, you want to add to that? Yes. Um, <laughs> no, I, I wholeheartedly agree um, with Dr. Trent and Dr. Williams on, you know, what they've been saying. I agree that museums aren't necessarily viewed as educational spaces or, or resources outside of the home and the classroom. Uh -huh. um, but I also think when we think about, you know, the focus of the museum, when we think about how we've been unknowingly teaching the public about black culture and black people to your to your question, Bridget, I really think it depends on the, the space itself. So, for example, the MoMA in New York City has a different focus than the Smithsonian in DC, right? So what that means is you're going to have different types of programs, exhibitions, you're amplifying different narratives and different stories. Um, and so with that being said, I can also remember as a child going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and thinking that, wow, this is the past, right? These uh -huh. things, this is, this is old, right? Uh -huh. so how do we as museum practitioners really drive the point home that while that is the past, it's still influencing our present and we uh -huh. have the opportunity and we are responsible to, to change our future. And so, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna leave that there. <laughs>
Y'all got me. I could have got up and shouted. That was wonderful. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So we're going to go on to question three. And I'm a big part. I love quotes. I love to read. And I, I work through quotes a lot because it helps me bring my point home a lot of times. So Philip de Montebello, uh, Philippe, is the former Metropolitan Museum of Art Director. And he referred to museums as, and I quote, the memory of mankind. And I love that quote. So with this in mind, who and what are museums currently remembering? And how can institutions ensure that Black history is not only remembered, but represented and interpreted with the same urgency as white American history? So I, I, I'll go with that one. Okay. So I feel that we're remembering the voices of our ancestors and their aspirations for the future. Mm -hmm. um, I would say continue to collaborate with other Black museums and organizations for programs, exhibitions, things of that nature. Continue mm -hmm. to have those discussions. Um, but to the point that Dr. made in regards to being respectful, okay? So we know that Juneteenth happens every June 19th. We know that Black History Month happens every, fe every February. Black Music Month is every June. Mm -hmm. Give the same respect that you would other organizations or other people in regards to programming exhibitions. Don't call me on a Friday for a program, don't call me on a Monday for a program on a Friday because we're an afterthought. So I think we have to continue to move into a direction where we are respecting or we're being respected um, when we're creating these programs and ex exhibitions and events that we're doing. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say. You know, and to build on what uh, Tamar was saying, I, I would add that, uh, mm -hmm. When we're looking at memory, memory is a powerful thing. And I think what museums do is beyond memory because memory is personal, memory is community based. And if we solely relied on memory, we would still have Confederate statues up in some places because that's what the memories value, right? There's a thing that we actually have to actively dispute. And so if we're talking about, you know, particularly in history museums, preserving the stories of mankind, that means we've really got to wrestle with what that reflects. And, and with African-American um, history and culture, there was a phase where we were just trying to prove that we were there, right? Um, there was a whole lot of work that was born by our predecessors who were just trying to demonstrate that if you wanted to say African-Americans were not part of the American Revolution, we just had to find the evidence that uh -huh. we were there right yeah. we've moved beyond that to now be able to talk about the nuance nuances of blackness in mm -hmm. different spaces you know you, we had to demonstrate that joshua johnson was doing these portraits at a time when portraiture was very important he's doing it for wealthy folks like there were just things that we just had to have evidence we had to have as people say the receipt for stuff now we can delve a little bit deeper uh, into that conversation. And I think what's incredibly important, and I've said this in other spaces, is whether it's the African-American community or any other um, BIPOC group that you're trying to work with, you cannot treat them in an exploitative fashion, which means you go in and get the artifacts, the material, the oral histories that you need. You have to start treating communities like you treat wealthy donors. Nobody yeah. goes to a wealthy donor and asks for $20 million right off the bat. No, you court them, you build relationships with them. If we're gonna do that for wealthy donors and corporations, you can do that for the communities that you value. So if you realize we don't have a lot of black, indigenous, and people of color voices in our institution. Guess what you got to do? You got to go out into the communities and build their trust. They want to know that their stories are not there for a period of time, but that you value them. Yes. As contributors to the community who have helped shape this country, and you are going to preserve their story as much as you respect Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Williams, do you have, whew, this conversation is good for my spirit. <laughs> I, um, and I, I found since I've been at TSU that, you know, in, 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 um, studying memory, I, I, it's, it's been an effort also to study what we have forgotten. 
Mm -hmm. What has been marginalized? What has been erased? And, you know, collectively, our memories are like our own personal memories. We celebrate, we elevate the stuff that makes us feel good. Uh -huh. And that other stuff we repress or we don't want to talk about it. Um, but in all honesty, those bad memories figure as prominently in our being as those good memories do. So when um, if you're talking about the history of Nashville, what we remember, what we celebrate in public places, we um, have to take a really close look at what is not out there. And that will inform our understanding, I think, of, of the president. Um, cannot talk about civil rights in Nashville, I think, without talking about lynching. We cannot talk about um, the protests that we see in the streets today. We see this and we, we grieve and there's a lot of gnashing of teeth and a lot of angst. Mm. But this seemed the, the first time that the police had gotten heavy handed. Right. Um, with with um, black Nashvillians. Um, so in, in, in dealing with memory and what we we um, you know what we celebrate in our museums or what we decide to remember in our museums, I think we got to um, take a look at a very close look at the stuff that we have forgotten, that we have erased, that we have marginalized, and probe a bit deeper to find out why that is the case. Um, and that includes every aspect of, of Nashville's history, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, uh, like to piggyback off what you said, what we choose to forget is just as powerful, if not more powerful than what we choose to remember, because, um, some of the stuff that we chose to forgot to forget technically should have never been forgotten. Mm. All right, we're going to move on. Question four, James Smithson, for who the Smithsonian was named, listed in his will that the creation of the Smithsonian Institute was for the, and I quote, increase and diffusion of knowledge. However, many museums are still grossly lacking both Black executive leadership and Black curators and historians. With this lack, how can institutions ensure that the diffusion of knowledge concerning the Black experience is leveled and accurate. I'll, I'll jump in on that. They can't. Yeah. I mean, I mean that's just that's really simple. You cannot. If you do not have diversity at the levels of your management, um, and in your curators, and even in your collections folks, um, people who are, are doing your collections management you are not going to be able to effectively diffuse those stories because there are things that you will look at you know and some of these folks may be allies but there are just some things that people may not know some connections they they may not know um if you don't have that diversity mm -hmm. you, you're not going to you're not going to be able to tell that story so yes while the work we do it's there's a noble um motivation behind it if your senior suite, if your board is not diverse, mm -hmm. reflecting multiple parts of the American experience, mm -hmm. there's no way you're going to diffuse a diverse mm -hmm. story because the mm -hmm. minute that someone decides, hey, this George Floyd thing is really important. Mm -hmm. Oh, our area museum, we know that we had a bunch of lynchings here in 1900. Well, if that gets suppressed, by the board or senior management, guess what story you didn't diffuse? Yeah. And uh -huh. then how are you not serving that mission? Uh huh. Uh huh. I love it. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I Dr. Trent on there. Simply put, they can't, like she said, without um, diversity, equity, inclusion in museums. How can we expect to diffuse accurate information? There isn't proper representation for our narratives, and mm -hmm. so it you know it really has to come from the top down. Mm -hmm. um, for example, let's say there's someone who is pr particularly on the front line or a curator and they want to do a particular exhibition or project or program on something and they take it to the upper management and they're not understanding why uh, it needs to be done. You, you uh -huh. get 
existence and then the, the, the stories are not being told. And yeah. so then you're not doing your job. It makes it challenging, it makes it difficult, and you're gonna continue to have issues of resistance against what needs to be put out there. And I, I, um, I just wanna add the diversity needs to be from top to bottom. Because I'll, I'll tell you what's gonna happen. Even they do reach out and they make one diversity higher. Yeah. Two three years down the road, that person is going to be exhausted. Yeah. And you know, we get into our fields. Um, I got into history because I like history, and I'm certain that y'all got into museums because you like museums. Mm -hmm. Y'all didn't get in there to fight every single day that you come in to work right, with your right. supervisor. Well, I got to convince the supervisor that this is important. I got to convince upper level management that this is important. And not only does that affect what the museum would present, and I'm speaking academically now, but um, the quality of your work will suffer as well because you're worn out before you can even get to the point where you're doing that thing that you want to do. Right. So um, everything suffers when you don't have the diverse voices, whether it's um, race or gender, whatever. Um, the more diverse your, your space is, the stronger everything will be. And here's the thing, it, it, what you were saying is not theoretical. Like there are actual, I can't tell you the number of BIPOC folks who come up to me at conferences and just want to talk over coffee because they are worn out. A diversity hire is not, you are not a diverse um, museum if you hire only one person from that community, right? They cannot bear the brunt of the work. And so you have people leaving institutions because they are literally burnt out. And I've know, known a number of people, I know Tamar knows the same folks, who left the field yep. because they have been burnt out. There is no real investment in um, cultivating them as professionals, bringing in more people to share the load. This work we have a passion for. I got into history. I have spent a lot of time and money, you know, do, getting educated so I could do this because I care about the community. I care about these stories, right? But when that care comes at a detriment to my personal health and well being, people have to make some very difficult decisions. And that's why you see people leaving the profession. If you value this, if you want to create substantive change, you got to build in that support point blank period. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I think it's also I would be remiss to leave off when you have these these individuals in your spaces, you have to ensure that when they are attempting to tell a story, you give them the space to tell the story in the way that will be digestible to their community, because it, just because you don't particularly understand the colloquialisms that are being used, because you don't understand what this phrase may mean, does not mean that that phrase or colloquialism is any less valid. Right. So when I begin to speak to a community in a dialect, when I start talking like I'm Black, that should not be a problem. And I think that's something that a lot of diversity hires, they go through um, because your your culture is not exactly the, the majority culture. And so you spend a lot of time defending how you talk and interpret. And that alone is exhausting. I, I completely agree. All right. Question five. In light of Black Americans' longstanding struggle for racial equality, what critiques do you have to offer museums who may still struggle with even talking about Black people? This question is particularly posed to plantation museums. Now, I'll jump in here because I was at a plantation museum for quite a while. Um, I think plantation museums first have to reconcile with the fact that there were slaves on your property. Right. Simply put, like you have to own that fact. And then once you own that fact, you have to do the necessary work in finding out who those people were, what those people did. And I don't mean that she was working in the house and that he worked outside. I mean, who were they as people? Right. 
Educate yourself on the culture of enslavement. How did people exist? How did people live? What did they eat? What did they wear? What is the common literature on the topic? What did freed slaves write about themselves in their time period? Um, anybody else feel like jumping in on that? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. I think people need to get comfortable with it or mm -hmm. be comfortable sitting in that discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. um, diversify your board, your staff. We've spoken about this numerous times throughout this conversation, but not just for the sake of filling a quota, right? Listen mm -hmm. to the black peers, hear us, empathize with us regarding our struggles, stand with us when we're fighting for injustices, educate mm -hmm. yourself not only on our struggles, but our accomplishments and help us celebrate them. Um, mm -hmm. So it's crazy to me that I have white friends who have never heard of Juneteenth until a week or two ago. Wow. That's insane. Um, and so when we think about plantations, we know that they are not pleasant histories associated with them. However, we can't run from it. We can't sugarcoat it. They may not want to touch on those not so pretty stories, but guess what? We had to live through them. And so uh. as you said, we have to, they have to honor our ancestors that who have built these plantations, tell the truth, tell their stories. You know, and, and to build on that, um, you know, I, I think the problem is, is that there are folks who want to have the gone with the wind mentality mm. and that mentality has now sailed. Yeah. Um, the time mm -hmm. for that is gone. Um, and so I, my question when people are resistant to that is, why are you resistant? You know, I think that one of the easiest things uh, people can do, particularly whites, is read White Fr Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. I know that that book has come up on a number of occasions, but mm -hmm. use that to really analyze for yourself, why are you so scared mm -hmm. or intimidated about telling Black stories, particularly mm -hmm. on a plantation? People lived, died, were raped, beaten, tortured, celebrated, uh, did so many things in these spaces. What are you trying to um, prevent? What are you scared of? What mm -hmm. is that thing that in you that makes it resistant? Um, mm -hmm. Telling that story. Because the reality is, is that yes, some black people don't wanna hear about slavery. A lot of folks don't wanna talk about it because it's mm -hmm. hard. Yeah. It is 110% hard. But are you committed to engaging with descendant communities? Are you committed to saying, okay, what are the stories of the community surrounding this plantation? Because I guarantee you, there are some families in that community who had a connection with that plantation for generations. Yeah. Right? Are you willing to excavate your gorgeous fields mm. on an archeological dig to mm. really see where, um, the, where these cabins were? where these people lived, what happened, where is your slave cemetery? Because guess what? Everybody has to be buried somewhere. Yeah. Are you willing to do the work? But if you are resistant to that, then mm -hmm. I, I push you to consider why. I will also refer people to, um, there is a interpreting slavery and engaging de descendants community rubric that was put together by uh, James Madison's Mount Pillier and distributed by the American Association of State and Local History. That also is a guide that as you're trying to do this, it helps you understand what some tangible steps you can take. But if the if your initial thought is a personal reaction, I encourage you to analyze that. I absolutely agree. There's also a bit of a discord between how do we interpret enslavement empathetically without inherently damaging the reputation of the individuals who own the plantation. I think you see a lot of <laughs> a lot of turbulence there, but that stretches a little bit farther into how we uh, interpret the, the history of the South in general, because I don't think that you can accurately and empathetically interpret Southern Black history without making certain legacies look bad. It's, you, you can't do it. You got to come to terms with it and you have to move on past it. If you want to really interpret the, the full truth of Southern history, you have to just call it for what it is. We got to quit dancing around it. Well, yeah. you know, it's not just Southern history. It's American history because there's, there's slave holding in the North. Um, so let's not like South doesn't have a, have a <laughs> premium on bad yeah. practices. They were everywhere, right? 
Right. So I want to say that. But the other thing is, is that when we talk about slavery, we have to put it into the context of the times. So, yes, did people own slaves? Absolutely. But guess what? That was a way that people earned money. Widows were not allowed a whole lot of land ownership or could start businesses. So what's one way a widow was able to make money? Buying and selling slaves. That's what they did. And uh, Dana Ramy Berry has a great book on that. There have been a couple of books that have come out about how women were able uh -huh. to sustain themselves. I'm not saying that these are bad people, but understand this is the system that existed. Yeah. And this is how people participated in it. We got to just call a spade a spade. Is it damaging their reputation? I don't know, but let's be honest about the history that we're interpreting. And Absolutely. Just to, um, piggyback on that really quickly. Um, I think a lot of places want to talk about enslavement without talking about the violence that was necessary to maintain it. Mm -hmm. um, none of those folks picked tobacco or cotton or indigo or grew rice or whatever. They didn't do that just because they wanted to make the folks that enslaved them some money. They made it as a result of the threat of the lash, mm -hmm. the club, the whip, and the gun. And we know that they weren't um they weren't in a position where they 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 were where where what's the word i'm looking for they where they did it because they want to do it and they were satisfied with it they were complacent because we have newspapers full of slave advertisements yeah. where they ran away i think i posted some on twitter this morning um about a pregnant woman who ran away and I thought about what courage that must have taken, but she resolved that um, whatever the, my life is for this baby, it ain't going to happen right here in Nashville. Mm. But there's another thing I want um, want y'all to consider as well when we look at these plantations. You know, before this came on, we were talking about homecoming, right? Uh huh. And um, this is the way homecoming usually plays out in my house. Um, my folks come up. Um, they stay for a couple of days and then they leave. And when they leave, the refrigerator is empty. Uh -huh. My best libations are gone. <laughs> no gas in the car. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, what, I, what am I getting at here? Um, my folks come here for four days, maybe. But mm -hmm. as I walk around my house, there's evidence that they have been there. Their fingerprints are all over the place. Mm -hmm. So how can I go to Hermitage where there were a hundred, and I'm not caught because I have friends work out there. I'm just this the one that's right down the street from me. How can I go to a space where there were a hundred enslaved African-Americans, 150 enslaved African-Americans, not just for four days, not for 40 days, but for maybe two, three generations. How can I go there and look at that space and not see their fingerprints all over it? How can I talk about those, all those acres of land without talking about the enslaved people who had to knock down those trees, who had to prepare that ground to be farmed? Yeah. Um, and, and this is not a mystery because we have the evidence, right? We got the overseer's book, we got the wills, we got all of the probate records. So how can you tell that story and omit the, the, the group of people who made up the largest population on those plantations? How can we do that? You can't unless you, you're lying to the people or you're just misinterpreting the history. So um, I don't know, I guess my message to plantations, and if if I'm ever invited to look at your plantation, this is what I'm going to tell you. Um, if you're going to tell a real story about these spaces, you need to make sure that the voices, that the experiences of the people who made up the majority of the people that move there, that live there, are represented. Absolutely. To, to echo on what you said about their fingerprints, um, I had the privilege of going to James Madison's Mount Pillar for a summit and they showed us a brick. And in that brick was an enslaved person's fingerprint. 
It's most, one of the most powerful objects I've ever seen in my life. And in that moment, they've done a great job of incorporating the descendant community into the work and into their interpretation and rebuilding slave cabins and, and, and things like that. But in that moment, to look at that brick and to see someone's fingerprint and wonder who they were, what they meant. And because my family's from that region of yeah. Virginia, that's where they were enslaved. That could have been someone I related to, right? right. There right. is power for the community to see quite literally the fingerprints on the wood and on the bricks mm -hmm. of the lives that lived there. So mm -hmm. I question your integrity when you want to hide those stories and when you want to cover up those fingerprints, because they are quite literally in the dirt of those plantations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, yes, yes, and yes, again, there is uh, just to throw this out there for those of you who are looking for literature to read more on these topics. Uh, there's a woman, Dr. Betty Kears. She wrote a book called The Other Madisons, The Lost History of a President's Black Family. Um, Dr. Keir sent me an advanced copy of the book. I read it. It is absolutely amazing. And if you're looking for something a little bit more first person on a person's journey towards finding her own heritage and history on a plantation, that would definitely be somewhere that I would encourage everyone to start. But we're going to move into our last question before we start taking a couple of questions. Uh, question number six. Cultural competency is rooted in action, not just words of encouragement <clears throat> or solidarity. If you all could think of one thing that the Tennessee State Museum can do right now to magnify and amplify the voices of Black Americans, what would it be? I wanted to make sure that we brought it back home for our last question. And how can the Tennessee State Museum do more? So I think that they are. With programs like this, um, hiring you to work there, like they are already doing that and are on the path to that, but I think they need to continue to diversify the staff, upper, upper management, and reflect the communities that they're serving. Um, I often say that you can't be an institution and have programs and initiatives that don't reflect the communities that you want to not only visit your museum, but truly be engaged with what you have going on. So mm -hmm. that would be my recommendation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> mine would, <clears throat> excuse me, mine would be this. Um, Start looking at spaces that you haven't looked at before. Um, I know it's the Tennessee State Museum, but Tennessee is bigger than, um, it's bigger than Memphis, it's bigger than Nashville, it's bigger than Chattanooga, it's bigger than the cities. There's some really, really powerful, powerful stories that are occurring in our rural areas, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in the promised lands of Tennessee. In the in the in the areas where um, black folks carved out lives for themselves, both during um, enslavement, during Jim Crow, and many of them are still there today. These are really powerful stories, I think, um, that um, are underrepresented in the museum, and some of that. Um, can be due to lack of outreach, but then there's others where I know that oftentimes our material culture, our, our, our the stuff we have is very, very personal to us. A lot of times we don't want to release our memories. So those Bibles, those, um, yeah. those poll tax records might be sitting up in a box in somebody's basement, but those those things are, are really, really powerful. And yeah. lastly, um, look out your window and see what's going on around you. Um, the, the, the museum is in a really interesting place because gentrification is occurring in all directions. And frankly, we're not going to know what existed outside of those those doors outside in those those spaces so um greater public engagement i guess with underrepresented groups absolutely 
You know, I think one of the things that's really important, both for state museums and blowing this out for other museums is to take a look at what the digital realm offers you in terms of possibilities. There are some things that tell great aspects of the stories, but their um, families do not want to part with them. You know, there are some objects within my family that are, you know, there are only a few objects from my great great grandparents. As much as I love museums, there's no way I'm giving that to them. If I let you take a photograph, mm -hmm. let you do a 3D scan, you know, mm -hmm. so those are the ways that we have to think of that. Um, a state museum is uniquely positioned to represent the experiences of all people. And so how can you get other communities to feel like the state cares about preserving those stories? And uh, to echo Dr. Williams' point, it's in those small communities. It's it's the women, it's the children, and it's so caring about, you know, where those stories are found. You know, it, there's value in the people who came out of the coal mines, right? That there are some folks. There's a contingent of people who don't place value on that experience, and you relegate that to being poor whites, blacks, or whomever. And they had nothing to offer. Guess what they do? Uh -huh. A state museum is uniquely positioned to say to those people who, by the way, may not be the most eloquent people. They're not going to say the right thing at the right time. There may be a few pejoratives, gender, race, sexual identity wise that come out of their mouth. But if you care about those stories, if you care yes. about creating something that reflects the community that makes up the state, and has carried the state from generation to generation. You got to get out there and you got to cultivate those relationships and you got to preserve those stories. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. This conversation has fed me both intellectually and spiritually. Um, I'm a preacher's kid, so I find a way to throw some spirituality into every single thing that I can. So I'm so grateful for y'all for being here today. We're going to try to take some questions, I believe, but I cannot see the questions. So I'm going to throw this back off to our um, media team. Maybe they can help me out here. Bridget, you might have to open the chat, and if not, one of us can. Okay. Let's see here. Just click the little chat button because you've got ah, a lot of questions. I see it. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> so let's see here. We have a few. Uh, so, yes, we can put a list of books out there. We will get on that as soon as possible. Mm. Oh, man. Uh, Dr. Trent was mentioning, yes, James Madison's, it's Montpelier or Montpelier? Montpelier. Montpelier, okay. I did post a, a couple of links in there. One of them is to actually the website uh, in the chat. So for anyone who's interested, they can go to the chat and, and scroll through there and find them. All righty. So here's one, very interesting. I recently heard a story that employees of a human rights museum in Canada were asked to leave out LGBTQ information for certain groups, including religious and school groups by management because they were asked to. Whether it's LGBTQ or black history, do you feel museums have a duty to provide history, even if it's uncomfortable to the viewer or groups? Mm. Absolutely, I, I can take that question because that relates to what we do. 110%. If you are coming to visit our un institution, understand we are not sanitizing the story for your comfort. We are telling the story um, as it is. Now, for a human rights museum, I don't care where they are, and to exclude the LGBTQ plus community in that story is a gross, um, I would say, I'm going to use some strong language, that's gross negligence. That is what, that's exactly what that is. Um, what should have happened is referred the, your visitors to your mission of the museum. Now, how the visitor, I believe in visitor autonomy. So whether or not they chose to skip that part, that's their business. Whether or not they choose not to engage with whatever programming, 
um, there is around that, that's your business as a visitor. But as an institution, particularly based on human rights, we have an obligation. There are people who are dying yes. because their LGBTQ plus identity. Transgender men and women are being murdered. Yeah. Murdered. And you want to take their okay. stories out because people have religious objections. You can have religious objections, but you know what my greater religious objection is? My greater religious objection is killing someone because you have a difference with them. That's the problem. So there's an the ethical responsibility we have. And as a human rights organization, and I know I'm a little heated right now, but it's free. Oh, I'm allowed to have, have it. it. You're right. There is an ethical obligation that if you value human rights, you value all human rights, whether you understand that person's journey or not. And one of those fundamental rights is the ability to live your life without threat, torture, or being murdered. Excluding that is gross negligence, unethical, and they should be ashamed of what they did. Yes. Everything she said. Yeah. Um, and our next question piggybacks pretty much off of the same thing. How do we impact people that are not interested in history and do not take the time to learn the past and the drive for future advancement and social change? Um, I will speak to that. I, I don't think that you can change anybody's mind. No. I don't try to. I don't. That's not my, my goal. I think the only thing you can do is put the information out there. You have to put it out there in a way that the majority of people will understand and you kind of just got to hope for the best. Um, I, I don't I, I don't try to connect with people who aren't interested in my history. That's just my personal view. Anybody else kind of feel some type of way about that? I, I agree with that. I mean, our duty and responsibility is to put the information out there, but we can't make people we can't make people drink the water. We mm -hmm. can't make people be engaged in what we're talking about. I think the only thing that we can do um, as stewards of these voices in this history is to just put the information out there. Yeah, and, and what I tell my staff is, you know, if someone walks into our museum, regardless of what they look like or what they think their politics are, that's already a statement of interest, right? Mm -hmm. The reality is, is we do not know how our programming, how our exhibitions impact people immediately or years down the line. Our job is to tell the story, right? And you get it out there the best you can. You can't change everybody's mind, but what, and you also do not know the impact of what you've done will have. It may not be today. It could be four or five years from now that someone who's visited your interest institution, saw a program, participated in something, has an aha moment because of the story that they told. You know, for all I know, there's somebody who visited the National Civil Rights Museum a few years ago and with this whole George Floyd incident and they're in conversation and all of a sudden, for some reason, at this particular moment, everything they saw at the museum now clicks and makes sense. Is it frustrating? Didn't make sense to you when you visited? Yes, but I have to realize that people's lives and experiences will inform the process of how that knowledge works together. And there are things that operate in the back of our head and somehow something clicks and it makes sense for folks. So we have to allow that to just happen and just do the work. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're gonna make this one our last question. Um, and I chose it because I think it's very relevant. She said that the it's a powerful statement to say the museums are not neutral spaces. I agree that they are. How can we make changes to make them more of an encompassing space for all people in the state. It ain't easy. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> right. it, it, it's, it's definitely not easy. And if there was a rubric for it, everybody would do it. I think part of it is looking at your strategic plan. I think part of it is figuring out the mission of your institution and what stories you want to tell and then figure out how you want to incorporate those communities. You know, uh, the Wing Luke Museum for Asian American History in Seattle does some really great community curation. And so I would look at anything published by them um, about engaging communities in the curation process um, to see how you bring voices to the table and sustain voices at the table. Um, but it's a marathon, not a sprint. So if you're expecting this to change overnight, it will not. 
But if you're committed to the change and building partnerships with organizations and groups and going outside of your comfort zone, I think you will be rewarded by what will happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much once again for being a part of this conversation today. This has been so inspiring. I'm going through the comments and they're so positive. I'm so happy that people enjoyed it today. And if you guys want to keep up with us, of course, the Tennessee State Museum website, we post as much as we can there. Uh, Dr. Trent is at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. Uh, make sure if you've never been down there, go down there. That museum is the reason that I am in the museum field today. Um, Dr. Williams is definitely at my beloved Tennessee State University. Go Big Blue, support HBCUs. And Tamar Smithers is at the new and wonderful National Museum of African American Music. So they should be opening in September. And we're looking forward to making sure that welcoming them into the Nashville Metro Tennessee history field. So thank y'all again and happy Juneteenth, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. <laughs> Talk to y'all later. Thank you so All much. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.